plays 53 guitars. He dreams of rock music, but this is just his second best talent. Akshat Bhatt is one of the top young talents in Indian architecture. His clients range from the Oberoi to Unitec. His largest project has been a township, his smallest a chair. He builds whatever he gets as if it were a story. Akshat Bhatt is on our talk with me, Jajhar Singh, to talk about his best work. Akshat, thank you very much for joining us on our talk. No, my pleasure. We're sitting here at the Neil Sutra store in the Oberoi Gurgaon. We'll talk about this project of yours later, but let's talk about the Discovery Center in Bengaluru. It's a standout work of yours. Yes, I think it's one of the first um, town halls to be designed the way it was, and it's, uh, <laughs> it was one of our first uh, big buildings. Who was your client? What was the brief over here? The client was, um, it's a real estate development firm called uh, Bharatiya International uh -huh. and they were doing uh, a 125 acre township in the outskirts of Bengaluru, uh, it's called Bharatiya City uh -huh. and the brief was simple, they said we want to talk about all the positives that are associated with new development and we'd like to now start telling people about these new values of development through our first project which would be the Discovery Center. So the Discovery Center was meant to be an office, information center, and a town hall for the Bharatiya city. Yes. So you put a building over there, and then you put a red egg. We'll talk about all that. But the building is very interesting because you played with the Bengaluru weather. Well, the first time I got to Bangalore, I realized how crisp the sunlight is and how beautiful the sky is. And there's something about the, you know, the Bangalore air, uh, which is just a refreshing change for someone going there from Delhi. Mm -hmm. And... You're also talking about the outskirts of Bangalore, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, kind of. Well, it's it's on a it's on a it's on a it's very close to the airport. It's on a peripheral ring road, so it is soon going to be like a, the hard. The air quality is better out there. Much better. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, as an architect, it's all, almost like a dream to sort of work in a metrop in a metropolis and yet have that quality of sort of natural elements around, mm -hmm. and you want to capture that. Well, the Bharatiya city is about a high quality of living out there. So I suppose you were playing with the sun and the air of Bangalore to allow it inside the building. The overall experience is essentially just a glass box playing with the natural elements, but just orchestrated and dramatized in a way where it seems, it seems to heighten the experience. Let's look more closely at how the sun is coming into the building. The sides of the building are glass and you've got this ceramic printed material with which you control the entry of the sun. How do you do that? Well, it's, it's actually called a moray, which is an interference pattern, and it was used by painters in the past. Mm -hmm. So when the sun moves in front of the building, it, you know, the shadow pattern changes. And because we've got all these little interferences going on, it seems like the building's constantly moving. And as you move as a viewer, uh, you know, your perspective's changing. So, you know, we didn't have to then resort to too many gimmicks. We just had this one system of skin which would then result in a building that appears to be changing throughout the day. And the printed glass allows you to control the amount of sun and heat coming inside the building. Yes. You're also getting some sun coming through the roof of the building. How's that? Yes, so the roof is transparent and then uh, there's a couple of layers of uh, transparent material or translucent material. Mm -hmm. And then we have a series of louvers or sunbreakers that then control the angles at which the sun comes in. So we did you know, we did a 365-day uh, study of the sun movement, and uh, we started then modulating these angles accordingly, and we've optimized the angles of the sunbreaker so that you always see something nice and crisp on, in the interior space. That's one of the most important things of, you know, of modern living, right? I mean, what is, eventually, what is luxury if it's not, you know, good quality of air and light and, uh, you Even know, while you're inside. Even while you're inside, <laughs> yes. So you got this building over there and then you got a red egg in front of it. What's that? <laughs> uh, so it's a bit like what Oscar Wilde said, right? It's only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. <laughs> because the true beauty of the world is in the visible and not mm -hmm. the invisible. Mm -hmm. So we try and, you know... They place a lot of emphasis on the visible. Yes. Yeah. And so we try to... You've got to quickly attract people out there. Yes, so it's a red egg. Red is the longest wavelength, so you see it from, the from a long distance. Uh, it symbolizes the germination of a new city or the birth of a new city, so it's an egg, right? It's, uh, well, it looks like that. If you look at the placement, it looks like the building is laying the egg. Or, yeah, kind of, sort of. Uh, then that is actually an auditorium, 
and that's where they play the film. Red Egg. The Red, the Red Egg. Egg is an auditorium, a movie hall. Movie hall to tell people about what's coming next, how the development's actually proceeding. How do you want Akshat people to feel when they're inside this discovery center? You want people to feel like they're a part of something larger than themselves, or just a small or a real estate development as such. You want them to feel like they're a part of a much larger positive. You want people to feel happy there. Yes. They're close to the environment, the air is around you through the glass, the sun's coming in, you have a red egg out there. It's about being happy. Yes, it's about being happy. It's about being happy, m meeting other people, just sort of being, a, being involved in the process and the part of it. Akshay, let's move on and talk about another very interesting project of yours. You did the India Pavilion for the Hanover Messe in Germany, the largest industrial fair in the world. How did that happen? I think it's just one of those things, right? If you want to do something, the you know they say the universe sort of conspires to, to make <laughs> it happen for you. And then there was so much talk about the Make in India program, and as a designer, one would look at it and say, hey, you know, this is this is really something that you'd want to do. And you know, the Hanover Messe grounds are almost like hallowed grounds for architects. So you have some of the best architects building some of the best buildings there or country pavilions there. And you know, and I believe that your pavilion was just the best pavilion in the 65-year history of the fair. So I've heard, yes. <laughs> uh, what was the story you were telling here? What was the brief for the project? Well, the brief for the Make in India program, it was the best possible representation of the Make in India program. Yeah. And uh, we realized we had to show this culture that's deeply rooted in the past, uh, which is now trying to change and progress into the new millennium or into, into new systems. So of course it's about... And to invite people to invest and make in India. Yes, it's definitely about committing to do certain things, about our commitments to deliver certain things mm -hmm. uh, to these people who'd come in. So you're trying to show confident India, you had a bold line over there, which of course has become a symbol of make in India with products all around it. The big line that a lot of people see was done by an artist called Prasad Raghavan, mm -hmm. and it had you know, products that generally come out of India. You also divided the space, the pavilion, into nine sections, the Navagraha. What is this nine-grid system of planning? The Navagraha planning principles are actually an ancient planning system that comes out of India. It's based on, uh, on a few mythological principles and is meant to actually divide energies yeah. so that you can optimize the use of energies in balance energy up. balance them out the idea is if you balance the energies of the space then the people inside the space feel balanced within themselves as well yes certainly so you had these thick blue lines on the floor of the pavilion which divided the nine sections yes it was so it was divided well distinctly in some areas and subtly in some areas you've also got a cafeteria in the pavilion and you've got six six meter high trees over there yes. what are you trying to do well, it's a soft power, right? You really have all these industrial materials and this mechanical stuff going on. And when you offset it, it's almost like a, a dissonant element in the composition, which makes you realize the importance of one versus the other, right? So this pavilion was really trying to project India as an environmentally conscious economic power growing on the basis of its traditions and culture. Yes, uh, and if I can add to that, I don't think any dialogue on development today is, can be independent of uh, a dialogue on environment and sustainability. But we often forget the dialogue on cultural sustainability, mm -hmm. on our continuity. And so I think I, this pavilion actually, I think, was, was a lot about that dialogue as well. That yes, we are a part of the global development and we are a progressive nation, mm -hmm. yet we are very conscious of you know, what we bring to the table with our history and our, and our heritage. Akshat, how did you become an architect? Because I believe when you were young, you couldn't draw to save your life. Well, I have two left thumbs still. <laughs> and my uncle was an architect. Mm -hmm. And I went to his house one day, and, and my, by uncle, I mean my, you know, he was a very close friend of my father's, and I went to his house one day, and I saw him sitting on this giant drawing board with very interesting stationery. And I said, so what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm an architect. And I, I, I didn't care about what he did, I actually just loved the stationery, I wanted that stationery. Mm -hmm. So my dad said, well, if you can, if you become an architect, you get that sort of stationery. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to do this too, <laughs> so that I could get the stationery. So you weren't very good in drawing, but you were very good in fabricating a story, building a story. Yes, I, I could really weave, uh, weave 
a lot around a small little idea. You're now just 37 years old. You have your own architecture firm called Architecture Discipline. What's your design philosophy? Let's just say that we're very conscious of having a positive impact on people and their lives uh, uh, and a positive impact on the surroundings of our building. So it's not just about what we do. It's about you know, somehow managing to influence the area around you as well uh, through whatever intervention you create. I believe you also heavily into guitars and rock music. <laughs> You own like 53 guitars? Yes, uh, collected them <laughs> collected them over the years with great difficulty. Each one of them has a story, yes. You play them well? Uh, not too bad. Music has helped you with architecture? Yeah, I think I got hooked on to music way before I got hooked on to architecture. So it was, I was 13 when I first picked up the guitar. As I started listening more and more to bands like Tool and uh, you know, new metal, I started understanding polyrhythms, you know, which are a series of you know, melodic logics that are sort of overlaid and they create their own, they're, they're doing their own thing. Well, they have different create. rhythms which are playing simultaneously. Yes. But in a coherent way. Yes. And you feel that that's what architecture is about. I think, yes, a, a lot of that, most of architecture and visual composition that is dynamic is about that. I realized that whenever I see like the work of a master that, you know, you see a photograph or you see a drawing and it's a two-dimensional or a three, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a two-point perspective. But as you experience the space, there's just so much more to it. And that's the difference between a great work and an average work. You know, an average work photographs very well. A great work just feels a lot more. Let's talk about this space where we're sitting, the Neil Sutra fashion store at the Oberoi Hotel in Gurgaon. You've designed this. What was the brief over here? You know, uh, Ashish and Deepika, when they first met me, they, they owned the store. And when they first met me, they said, you know, we'll, we have the store and we're sitting next to Gucci and Burberry and Jimmy Choo, which are these, these, these uh, sort of uh, behemoths, you know, as such, and like firmly established brands. So they said, we've come to you because we want you to create something which is definitely Indian mm -hmm. and yet has to have a design presence of its own. It Make should it. be able to attract attention in the middle of Jimmy Choo and Gucci and the others. Yes, it has to hold its own. So let's see what you did. Let's begin with the entrance. You put a 15 feet high zinc door. It looks like the door of a fortress. Yeah, well, it was inspired by what <laughs> you see at, uh, at, well, most of the forts and fortresses in, in India. So you would have these timber doors, which had, which had sort of a thin film of metal sort of beaten all over them. And um, we had the shortest frontage. We had the lowest frontage. Everybody else has 20 feet, we had 15. So we made the giant opaque door to sort of make a statement. And to draw quick attention to the store. Yes. Your entrance is like a fortress, but the inside is like a hut. Yes, so it was, <laughs> again, it was meant to sort of, you know, it's, it's a series of contradictions and cross conversations, right? So this was shaped like, uh, like how a child would sort of draw a little house, like the house of Indian fashion or so to speak. You used 11 different kinds of timber around here. Why is that? Because this is meant to be a curated store with a certain number of designers. So we were told, we were given the number of designers that would be curated. 11 designers showing their clothes here. Out, out of here, yes. So you used 11 timber. We used 11 <laughs> Indian, forgotten Indian timbers. Yeah. Why forgotten? Well, I think we, we, we tend to not uh, go by what is our material resource. We tend to go by what's available to us in the market. I think a lot of... What are these forgotten timbers you've used here? There's Paduk. Uh, there's, which is like this bright red, almost sindoor-like timber. There's, there's uh, uh, safeda, which is eucalyptus. There's a little bit of uh, poplar, and there is there's mango, and these are all, and there's babul, which is which is basically uh, a red kikar tree. So these and are, why they've forgotten? What are people using instead these days? I think a lot of design and uh, uh, especially the building, building industry design has become a lot about products available in the market and available off the shelf. Mm -hmm ready to use and easy products to Products like, wood like? Uh, well, you have oak, you have uh, timbers that are coming from Africa like Venge. But what's the idea behind reviving these forgotten Indian timbers then? I think there's no... What's the statement you're making here? I think there's no easier way to make a cultural connection or the connection to the spirit of a place than to start using the materials that come out of that space. What's also interesting is that the store is called Neil Sutra, Blue Thread. Yes. So you've got a Blue Thread installation over here. Yes. Uh, this came from a friend who, uh, you know, with, 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 who helped us with the brand. So 
the story of the weave sort of does sort of does play in does play into this entire narrative it's quite branding yes how do customers feel when they're out here i've been told that there are people who come in very often would like to sit in the store and order a cup of coffee or you know uh, something to sip or drink or eat and they'll actually call for things from stores like gucci and Burberry and all, and they'll say, "Come and show us your wares here, because we'd like to just sit so here and sit then... over here and have a look at Gucci." Yes. <laughs> what are your favorite three buildings around the world? Well, the first one I have to say is a small rooftop extension by a firm called Coop Himmelblau in Vienna. That's actually what got me started, because that's when I realized that architecture could be like energetic and mad and almost like you know, a performance in itself. Uh, the second one is the Centre Pompidou uh -huh. uh, in Paris, in Paris yeah. uh, just because of what it is. And let's not forget that that was a building delivered before time and under budget. Well, this is amazing, actually, isn't it? Because all the functional el elements of this building, like the water pipes, the AC pipes, even the escalators, are placed outside the building, freeing up the space inside. Yes, and so the the internal space is available completely for experience and the outside space is then now a statement in the heart of this highly contextual Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that really moves me is also again by uh, Renzo Piano. Uh, uh, it's called the Tijibao Cultural Center, which mm -hmm. is in New Caledonia. Your favorite works of architecture within India? You know, I recently visited Nalanda because we're doing a school in Bihar. Mm -hmm. I think that the Whatever I've seen on Nalanda University really moved me. In Delhi, I'm, I, I, I like the India International Center. I think that's, it might just be because I grew up there and it's like comfort space for me. And the third is the National Center for Performing Arts in uh, Mumbai. Mumbai, Nariman Point. Let's now talk about one of your major projects now, the Hotel Manad Ranakpur in Rajasthan. It's a study in contrast, isn't it? You use this fortress-like stone and steel and glass. Yes, I mean, we were, trying to, we were trying to express time in, in that valley of uh, Udaipur. Uh, and of course, the, the, the most striking thing about that valley was the stonework and the bastions from all these forts and fortresses. You wanted to express that, you wanted to express that material, but also have something modern there and say, okay, how do these things actually interact and how would they move in time? And here's another contrast because Rajasthan has a lot of these domes going into the sky. You've got a sloping roof. Why did you do that? Oh, well, that was a contrast in composition because we had this old Haveli, a reconstructed Haveli sitting adjoining our plot. So we said, well, you can't really beat that because that's the real thing. So you started trying to contrast with it and create a dialogue within these adjoining plots themselves. What does the sloping roof do inside? For example, if you're sitting inside the restaurant of the hotel, what does the roof do for you? I think what, what really got me with Ranakpur was the sky and the purity of of it all. So, so here you can actually look out, in, A, you can look out straight into the sky, B. From the ground to the sky. Yes, it's, it gives you that connection. Yeah. Uh, and it sort of almost forces you to look that way as opposed to it being a flat skylight. The hotel has also got some cottages which you made by a dry riverbed. We can see the stones over there. Yes, well, you know, we've been, I guess, fortunate and unfortunate in some ways that every project has been technically very challenging. and. Uh, by planning the landscape carefully, we could actually orchestrate, you know, and animate the change of seasons in the valley. Uh, so that every time you come there, it's, it's a different experience. So when you go there in the summers, you sit by this dry riverbed. But if you go there in the monsoons or in winters, there's actually a little rivulet flowing through the site. Mm -hmm. So you can sit there while you're having your tea or, you know, a drink in the evening and actually put your feet in the water. Akshat, let's now talk about a few other projects of yours in brief. You've done this house for a well-to-do family in Delhi. It looks very nice, day or night. The brief to us was simple that, you know, we're a joint family, we would like to cook together and we like to eat together, which is an unusual brief and that's the only brief. Mm -hmm. And so we designed this house in section more than in plan, so that the entire planning appears to be transparent while you still got privacy in the space. If I was going to ask you that, because if you look at the house from the outside, with all the glass and the facade, one wonders where's the privacy for the people inside? So we often forget that you, can, you don't just plan things on the horizontal plane, you can actually plan things along the vertical plane. So this house has been orchestrated on the vertical plane, mm -hmm. so you can actually create privacy along this axis as opposed to this one. 
So the glass is in the facade, but as soon as you go inside, there are walls which are coming up vertically, so that prevents the viewer outside from going too much inside with his eyes. Yes. Uh, while being inside, you can still, because you're a regular user of the house, you know how to look out and experience, uh, you know, the treetops. I noticed one more thing. If you go to the first floor, there's a sloping roof in front of you. What's the purpose of that? That's the upstairs living space, which is overlooking the living space downstairs. What we consciously did there was actually made an old-fashioned metal railing. And the sloping roof actually sort of pushes your view down. It makes you, it forces you to look down and then forces the interaction between the family uh, in, a, in a subtle way. But you know, you realize that, you know, look, there are intellectual cues in your built environment. And if you trigger those intellectual cues, you, do, you can tweak uh, behaviors and, 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 yeah. and motions. Yeah. This is what makes architecture so fascinating. Yes, it's the three-dimensionality of it all that, that does, that you can actually do that, you, you know, and... Uh, Let me just quickly ask you, somebody wants to build a house, some quick tips, tips from Akshat Bhatt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, A, find the right person to help you design it, mm -hmm. and B, once you've found the right person, trust them with it, because don't forget, a new space allows you the ability to live differently, right? So don't get, don't get too stuck with what you've been doing in the past. And we've had that, you know, we have that conversation very often. People, they'll come in and say, oh, but I like to sleep like this. But I said, have you slept any other way for you to know that you'd like to sleep like this? Because every new house is a new space, is a new energy with a different set of parameters. So don't get stuck to what you've got. You've done a very interesting art gallery in Delhi, Art District 13. I see that you use asphalt, which is the material with which we build roads. You've used it leading up to the gallery and on the flooring inside. And you've got a yellow line as well, like as if it's a road. Yeah, what are you trying to do over here? I think, you know, art galleries tend to be like these standoffish white boxes or then, you know, or such. So here we were trying to make it, you know, we we're saying, hey, art for everyone. It's a more democratic sort of statement. And You're inviting people in. We invite, we actually come from the road straight into straight the art in, gallery. Yes, we turn the road straight into the art gallery with complete with the yellow line and the white markings. It You're making art day. democratic. Yes, in a sense, and open to all. Akshat, shall we take a break now? Yes, yeah. let, let's, <laughs> let's take a break. Right, let's take a short break. We'll come back and talk about your current projects. Mm -hmm. One of the top young architects in the country, Akshat Bhatt, is with us. We'll be right back on our talk. Welcome back. You're watching our talk with me, Jujhar Singh. One of the best young architects in the country, Akshat Bhatt, is with us. Akshat, what are the exciting projects you're working on now? We're doing a small performative arts pavilion in Bangalore, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, a fairly iconic structure. Also doing an intervention in one of the oldest hotels in the country, the Oberoi Grand mm -hmm. in Calcutta. And we're doing there a public area. We're doing their all-day dining and bar. And that's an exciting project because you're sort of you're remodeling a 200-year-old project and you're working with, you know, uh, well, a fabled, legendary hotelier. Um, and we're doing this third one, which is uh, an urban regeneration project in Jodhpur. What is one project you'd like to do which you haven't been able to do so far? I'd like to do a healthcare facility in this country. A I, hospital? A hospital. How would you conceptualize it? I think a positive environment more than anything else, and I think that's what we lack. I mean, hospitals either tend to be these glass boxes nowadays, which represent at some level progress, but I'm not sure if that's the way for it to go. And uh, yeah. so, well, I'd imagine, you know, a space with a lot of natural light, a, a, well, a certain positive quality to it, a, a space where you don't feel like you're confined to a room where you can actually walk around or you can access other spaces, uh, access landscape, nature, and on the whole just feel more, you know, more sort of positive or charged mm -hmm. than, you know, being laid up in or being pooped and into close to the environment. Yes, certainly. Akshat, this has been very interesting, very creative talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us in our talk. Thank you for having me.